How's that? Is that, is that better? Good morning. My name is Leslie McLean. I'm a member of the worship team and the Emerson Choir. This morning, it is my pleasure to introduce and welcome our guest speakers, note plural speakers. Um, we have Darlene Ciomero Rodriguez, her husband David Schaefer, their son Noah Xavier Schaefer Rodriguez, 
and their friend Crystal Munoz. Our service today came about in part because we are looking at what is going on in the world today. The unfolding crisis in Ukraine, where there are countless individuals who are refugees due to the forced migration of war. Um, our theme of widening the circle for March and our topic today, crossing borders, could not have been better timed. As you entered the sanctuary today, you were greeted by a partial installation of an exhibit that lifts the stories of immigration youth. Some migrated to the US due to war, others due to the push and pull of immigration that simply happens worldwide. The exhibit creates a backdrop to today's service and our special guest. Darlene Ciomara Rodriguez is the curator for the exhibit as well as she is my colleague at Kennesaw State and a friend. She, her family, and close friend will be speaking to us about immigration and migration. Thank you in advance for leaning in during this service and returning for service reflections to know how to engage in this timely and important work. And just so you know a bit more about our speakers, Darlene is an immigrant scholar at KSU David is an immigration attorney with the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. Crystal is an immigrant analyst at the Georgia Budget and Policy Institute. So we are with people who are very familiar with this topic. And of course, Noah, who is here to represent the youth. <laughs> Each Sunday, we pause to light a candle of acknowledgement and remembrance for the Cherokee and Muscogee nations of people. These are the peoples who lived on this land before us, and we acknowledge their continual spiritual presence here. May this candle humbly remind us of our interconnection and the impact of our collective actions. May there be healing in all nations of people. Each Sunday, we also light our chalice. Its light is the symbol of Unitarian Universalism and a reminder of our commitment to be a beacon of love and hope in the world. Today's chalice lighting words are written by the Reverend Amy Carroll Webb. How often we seek refuge in this sacred flame from the world's trouble and pain. Today, may our lamp light the way for those who know no refuge, that we may open our minds, our arms, our hearts, and our mouths to sing, come whoever you are, holy new and holy true. Now in the spirit of the beloved community, let's greet and welcome each other to worship as we share our congregational affirmation we need not think alike to love alike. Those in the sanctuary, feel free to move around to offer a greeting to others. For those online, please use the chat to introduce yourself or unmute to say hello. the gong. <laughs> All right. Our opening hymn this morning is number 86 in the gray hymnal, Blessed Spirit of My Life. Please rise in body or in spirit as you are able.
Good morning. My, my name is Sandra Malik. It's not Ginger White that's in the, the service. Although if I make a lot of mistakes, I'm Ginger White. <laughs> and I serve as a member of Emerson's pastoral care team. This is a time in our service when we pause to reflect on and share joys, sorrows, and concerns in our life. I invite you to use this moment of pause to take a deep breath. Notice what's in your heart today. I want you to think of one good thing this week, something that gives you joy, something that you're grateful for whether it's the blue sky outside that doesn't even have a cloud or uh, lunch with a girlfriend, a, pu a puppy that you might be able to see this week. Put a smile on your face for the joys in our congregation. Perhaps there are also sorrows and concerns that you carry with you today. Allow this to be a time to give them space, to be held with gentleness and compassion. Take another deep breath. Now with an open heart, little bit of courage. I invite you to um, name someone that's dear to you that you're holding in your heart and say it out loud if you will. Teresa. to chat the names of people you are holding in your heart this week. Now let us send our heartfelt caring intentions to all beings everywhere by offering the Buddhist prayer of loving kindness. Okay, it's in the order of service. Repeat these words after me. May we all be filled with loving kindness. May we all be free from harm and suffering. May we all be well in body, heart, and mind. May we all be at peace. Blessed be. Did the little light go on? It did. Welcome, everybody. I am so happy to introduce you to...
we have sound. Yay. So I want to introduce you to my new friend, David. Excuse me, Noah. David says, pop over here. And Noah, you are a third grader, no, fourth, grader. fourth grader at Shalford Falls Elementary, not very far from here. And you have a favorite book you brought today. Um, it's called Iguales Pero Diferentes, which means the same but different in Spanish. Um, it's a story about a boy in America who becomes pen pals with another boy in India. Oh, don't, give the, don't give the plot away. You're good. Would you like to start reading? Today, in Elliot's class, the teacher announced a very special project, pen pals, or friends by mail. Elliot made a drawing of his world in art class. He titled it, This is My World. His teacher loved it so much that she sent it to a faraway country, India. A boy in India made another drawing of his world and sent it to Elliot. This is my world. The same, but different. P.S. What's your name? My name is Elliot, and I love to climb trees. My name is Kailash, and I also like to climb trees. The same, but different. In my city, the buildings are almost as high as the sky. Sometimes, it even looks like the sun is hiding behind them. The streets are full of cars, taxis, and buses. Here there are very few cars, but there is also a lot of traffic. The same, but different. I go to school on a school bus with all my friends. Me too, the same, but different. This is my alphabet, and this is mine, the same but different. My favorite class is art class. We make so many things, and mine is yoga class. I can be so many things, the same but different. My friends and I say hello like this. We shake hands, we high five, we wave, and we fist bump. My friends and I say hello like this. Namaste. The same, but different. We are best friends even though we live in completely different worlds. Or maybe not. <laughs> different, but the same. Thank you. Yay. That was awesome.
Awesome. Would you like to help us sing our song of dedication? Sure. That sounds great. Please join me. The words are in your order of service.
morning. My name is Krista Munoz. I am the Immigration Policy Analyst at Budget and Policy Institute, and David Schaefer and Darlene Rodriguez um, kindly invited me uh, to share with you a little bit of my immigration story, or I guess my family's immigration story. So um, when people often ask me, like, where are you from? It's, um, and then I tell them, oh, well, I'm from, I'm from here. And they're like, mm, okay. Well, because you know what the question is. It's like, well, yeah, you're from here, but you don't look like you're from here. So like, where are you really from? So whenever people ask me that question, I'm like, well, I'm from here, but my parents are originally from Mexico. And, um, and then that sort of kind of opens up like a whole can of worms. Well, okay, well, um, how did y'all get here? And it's, it's never right in your face, but you know it's always like in the back of their minds. So whenever I tell people my story, it never really starts in 1991, which is when I was born. It always starts, you know, um, around the 1980s. So um, my parents, like I said, they're originally from Mexico. They're from a really small town in a state called Michoacan that's around four hours away from um, the Mexico City. And um, my parents were very young when um, they decided to start their families. And um, around the age of when my older sister was around two or three, my dad made the decision um, that he was gonna come to the United States and you know, um, make uh, an opportunity, a financial decision for his family. Um, and he came here with a brother, and they worked. They worked um, primarily in restaurants uh, as a chef or as a cook, I, you know, starting off as like a bus boy and then a dishwasher and then working his way up eventually. Um, and then he had been here for around a year where he made the decision that, you know, like, this is where I'm going to be. This is where I'm going to stay. So he called my mom and he was like, hey, I think I'm probably not gonna come back. So if you want, you can come with me, and if you don't, I understand. And then at that age, my mom was probably a, you know, in her late teens, made the decision for her and my younger, and my sister, um, well, no, I'm gonna, I'm gonna come, I'm gonna keep my family together. Um, and then that's when their journey started. Uh, and they came around the 1980s, like the mid-1980s. So they had been here for a while. My dad was working. My mom was here taking care of my sister. And there's a, a cute little story. My, my mom got here around September. So um, I just had enough time for my sister to start school. And then there was one day um, in October where people started coming around knocking on doors. And my mom was there by herself with my sister because my dad was working. And she was like, I don't, who are these people? Why are they coming to our doors and knocking? So my mom turned off all the lights in their um, apartment that was located off of uh, Buford Highway. And she locked the doors and she turned off all the lights. And then my dad came home and he was like, what's wrong? Why are you so scared? And she was like, there are people knocking on the door. Like, what? what is this? What are they doing? And then my dad was like, because he had already been here for a year. And he was like, oh, it's, it's Halloween. This is what people do. They come around and they knock on doors and they ask you for candy. And mom was like, what? What is this? So then uh, they dressed up my sister as like a little cat and then they went around and trick-or-treated themselves. But that was just, it's just a cute story to tell um, just because of the cultural differences and, and also to kind of to show the fear that my mom was experiencing, you know. She was a young mother trying to protect her family, trying to keep her family together, while also trying to be somewhat hidden in a way and not in plain view. And, you know, even being scared to be in your own apartment, you know, um, where you're typically not seen, like having to turn off all the lights. So, and then in um, 1986, as you saw in the, in the video, was the Immigration Reform and Control Act. And because of that policy change that was done by Reagan, um, my parents were able to become documented. And that policy change really changed the, the trajectory of my life and of my family's life as well. Because um, throughout that time, my parents do talk about it. And they, my dad went first because it was a new policy and no one really knew what it meant or what it was gonna do or what it meant for um, 
their safety to stay in this country. So my dad went first and he, he was able to do it and he was fine. And then my uncle, my mother's brother, who had been in Florida when um, the policy change came in, he called my mother and he was like, why are you not here? And she was like, well, we don't, we don't know what's gonna happen and I'm afraid. And he was like, no, if you don't come, you're gonna miss out on this opportunity and we don't know when it'll happen again. So then my mom went and she was able to do her documentation and her paperwork as well. So what that meant is that my, both of my parents were able to be, to qualify as lawful permanent residences. Um, and through there, they were able to get documentation to work, uh, documentation to just live in Georgia and be in Georgia and not have to worry about um, deportation or arrest. And it really took a, a weight off of their shoulders. But what it also, it afforded my family the opportunity to, to for more for more economic opportunity, for educational opportunities as well. Um, because of that, my parents were able to save up money. They were able to buy a house, move to the suburbs. My older sister was the first person in our family to go to college. I was the second person in my family to go to college. Um, because of that, we were able to, you know, have a stable place to live, a stable, you know, upbringing. Um, my parents had stable employment throughout my whole life. Um, my dad is, um, is, his, is a small business owner as well. So um, I just look at my life and then I compare it to people who were not as fortunate to be here in Georgia during that time. And it's completely different. Um, I grew up in Gwinnett. So Gwinnett is a very diverse place. A lot of immigrants, you know, live there. Um, I went to Berkmar, which was a majority minority high school. And I went to school with a lot of kids who were undocumented. And um, it was very different. A lot of my friends were, the majority of my friends were undocumented. So when it came time to look at colleges, to apply to places, I was basically doing it on my own. Um, I had the only people I had to rely on was my sister because she had already gone through the process. And I was looking around at all of my friends and everybody was just like, yeah, well, you know, it's, it's expensive and I don't think I'm gonna be able to go and I'm probably just gonna do a, a job right out of work or right out of school and that's how it's just gonna have to be for a while. And I remember, you know, going to class like, by myself with no friends, kinda, cause it was just me. Um, and then, you know, visiting my friends at their part-time jobs after school and seeing like just, like kinda like the defeat in their face because they were not able to have the same opportunity that I did. And it wasn't because I was any better of a person and it definitely wasn't because I was smarter than them because <laughs> they were way smarter than I was. And I just remember the injustice and how unfair it was that I was able to have this opportunity and that they didn't. And it, the only reason that that was able to happen was because I have a, a nine digit number that's associated to my name. It happened because my parents were here at the right time and at the right place. And, and it, it really makes you wonder how different things are and um, for other people and my parents had no connection to the United States. Had my dad not been here at the time that he did, had my parents not done the, the documentation that it needed to happen to do that way, um, I probably wouldn't be here talking to you guys right now. I probably wouldn't be doing the line of work that I do. Um, and that's part of the reason why I do the work that I do is because I believe in policy change. Um, you know, the people who enact it are probably not always the greatest people. But I do believe in the change of policy and the, the effect that policy can have on people's lives and the positive effect that it can have in people's lives. So, so yeah, I think that's it. But thank you. Well, hello. Much like Noah said, iguales pero diferentes, Crystal's story is similar yet different from my own. So, buenos dias. Mi nombre es Darlene Xiomara Rodriguez de Bello Schaefer. Good morning. My name is Darlene Xiomara Rodriguez de Bello Schaefer. Y'all can call me Darlene. To be honest, I've never given my story in a setting like this. 
I'm nervous. <laughs> it even says so right here, but I am nervous. <laughs> um, after watching Noe Javier and mi comadre Crystal offer up her own rich life experience, as I talk about how my people came to this land, I would like to honor the Cherokee Nation, who for generations inhabited what became Cobb County before they were forcibly removed in 1838 in the wake of the 1830 Indian Removal Act. Those atrocities and others, like the forced enslavement of millions of black people, reverberate through the lives of newcomers like me. Such people had borders imposed on them, borders which I crossed over 100 years later, benefiting from the freedom that many of them had fought for. Like many immigrants from Latin America, I am the product of mestizaje, mestizaje is racial mixing. I am African, I'm indigenous American, and European all at the same time. Those bloodlines reflect some of the systems and history of genocide and enslavement I mentioned. So how specifically do these things show up in my life and in my story? On my father's side, my African ancestry originates from the Yoruba people who come from Nigeria, Benin, and Togo. My great-grandfather migrated from Africa to Cuba to work the sugarcane fields. When he came, slavery still existed in Cuba, established in 1886. From Cuba, his grandchildren, including my father, were able to make their way to the United States. My father's family were santeros, priests of Santeria or Lucumi, a religion that mixes Catholic doctrine with ancient African rituals. As a kid, I would attend rituals worshiping the Orishas, derived from the Yoruba divinities that were equated to the Catholic saints on Saturdays. But on Sunday, I would be at the Catholic Church in Sunday school, learning about the same saints in a very different light. On my Venezuelan mother's side, my ancestry is South American indigenous, Spanish and Portuguese. Like I said, my bloodlines reflect some of the oppressive systems and dynamics found right here in the United States. My mother had first come to the United States because my grandfather was a pilot helping to instruct and share with others how to do the first transcontinental passenger flights from South America and the United States. My mother lived in fear of my father. He was abusive and frankly quite dangerous. For years, he sent someone to follow me, to keep tabs on me, to make my mother fearful that he would take me away. My father turned my mother into a nervous wreck and she attempted suicide. Due to our mixed immigrant status household, my mother feared that my father would take me back to Cuba and she would never see me again. Having one foot in Venezuela and one here in the United States, in those days, my mom wanted to make sure that I was born away from my father, but on U.S. soil so that I might be safe and become a natural born U.S. citizen. She gave birth to me at a hospital in New York City, virtually in the very shadow of the Statue of Liberty. My mother divorced my father, and at a time where it was not acceptable in my culture or even in U.S. culture for a woman to do that, she found herself in the same situation my grandmother did, raising a child on her own in a foreign country. But she gave me a very privileged status because I was a U.S. citizen, even though that was not the case for the rest of my family. My mother always carried los papeles, my papers, with her. She never knew when or if my father would come to harm us, and she always wanted to have my papers on her in case the police needed to see them. Since my grandmother was divorced very young, my family came to the States with virtually nothing. We did not trust U.S. banks, for example, for they were very corrupt in Venezuela and Cuba, for that matter. We actually had all of our valuable possessions in a hole that was dug underneath our home, and I would be the one to crawl into that hole to retrieve the little money that we had. As I grew up, I knew we were different, even different from those around me who were also from Latin America. When you turn 15, for example, you have a quinceañera. We did not have the funds, nor the ability, nor the friends and family around us to do so. So we had a pool party instead. And lots of mementos were sent to me overseas to commemorate the moment. Around that time, I personally came to know Jesus Christ. I became a Christian and understanding that God loved me deeply and gave his son for me. I started to have revelations come. Some of those revelations came as I was in my high school civics class. 
I learned about nonprofits, how they have failed my mother, my, myself, my family. How the fact that our mixed immigration status had prevented them from supporting us when we needed it the most. Not only the government, but the church. Also around that time, I found my voice. I got counseling. I got angry. I confronted my father. I told him that he sent, uh, if he sent anyone after me and my mother again, that I would be the one calling immigration. For years, I experienced nightmares of being offered up to the Orishas. Those suddenly stopped when I faced my own fears. Importantly, my mother was able to achieve immigration status, ensuring a solid foothold in this country. Against this backdrop of pain, anger, determination, and healing, I became the stubborn student who rose from being an ESOL student to this top scholar. I am not smart, and I share in good company with Crystal who says the same, but we were determined. And so as part of that, I thought, let me follow through with the opportunities that have been given to me through such sacrifice. And in the words of Lin-Manuel Miranda from Hamilton, I'm young, I'm scrappy and hungry. I'm not throwing away my shot and I'm get, <laughs> gonna get a scholarship to King's College. I also determined I would serve immigrant families like mine to help them navigate the complex experiences among the systems that are built to harm them, knowing that even nonprofits' hands had been stained with the blood of indigenous peoples and black Americans. So with grit, surrender to God and his amazing grace, I got an education. I served in the AmeriCorps. I was a VISTA. I was a US Peace Corps volunteer. I worked with multicultural student affairs and engagement with community immigrant development. I earned an MSW and a PhD focused on public policy and nonprofit management determined to abolish, reform, and rebuild the systems that had failed my family. And now, as Leslie said, I'm her colleague and friend at Kennesaw State University in the Social Work and Human Services Department so that I can help students do the same. At the end of the day, it takes a surrendered, broken person, broken people like you and me, to pick up the pieces, confront evil, and redeem what has been taken. Honestly, some days I'm still that haunted little girl from an abusive father, hiding near the tancletas of my Venezuelan mother, who con el cuchillo entre los dientes gave her all so that I can make it. But my very worst day is God's very best day, and so my Heavenly Father is strong and he is good, and has been so much better to me than all the statistics that were piled against me, and even in my own heart that I could ever say I would become. So here with you and Crystal, my husband David, and our beloved son Noah, I hope you hear loud and clear some of the common themes. Human struggle, victory, and yes, the greatness that unites us because we are most importantly iguales pero diferentes. So as part of what you can do, what can we accomplish together? Thankfully, there are many nonprofits who have clean hands, who allow themselves to be led by community. One of those is Freedom University, a modern day freedom school for undocumented youth here in Georgia. You see, Georgia is one of only a handful of states that bars undocumented students from entering select public institutions in the state. And for those public institutions that do admit undocumented students, the charge rate is two to four times higher for tuition. So when you have this month's offering, we're asking you to consider giving to Freedom University to help serve and combat discriminatory practices that harm our immigrant youth. In fact, I even wrote a paper called FU. <laughs> about Freedom University and about the liminal state <laughs> that immigrant youth must navigate in order to obtain the American dream and not live out the American nightmare. I know you're gonna have some questions to discuss what you've heard from us, and we encourage you and welcome you to come back. We want to hear from you. Change takes all of us. We love you, and people need you. Our people need you. We need you, and ultimately we need each other. Thank you. Thank you, Darlene and Crystal. One way we seek to live ethical lives is by partnering with other organizations who work to bring love, kindness, and justice to the world. This month, we are partnering with Freedom University. Freedom University is an award-winning school for undocumented students banned from equal access to higher education in Georgia. Freedom University provides tuition-free college preparation classes, 
college and scholarship application assistance, mental health and legal support, and social movement leadership development for undocumented students. As a result of their collective work, over the last four academic years, 50% of their students have earned full scholarships to college. A link to Ways to Give is posted in the chat. For those in the sanctuary, as the basket is passed, please feel free to offer a donation or take a card which describes the many ways to give. All donations, unless otherwise specified, are shared equally. I'm John Malik. I'm a member of the Finance Committee here at Emerson. And this is a reminder that our annual stewardship campaign has begun. Uh, it's a couple weeks old now. Um, the theme is what the world needs now is more UU. And I think with what we've seen for the past couple years and what's happening now overseas, is the, the theme is very appropriate. More UU means to me more tolerance. So what we've done is to remind people to submit their pledge. You all should have received a brochure like this, either here or in the mail. And the back page of the brochure is a pledge card, or you can submit your pledge online. We do this annually because we are self-supporting. Everything that happens here is because we pay for it. There, the funding is all internal here. So uh, the theme being this is the world, or what the world needs mo more of, is that uh, the committee came up with the idea of these little chocolate globes. Everyone will get a chocolate globe if they uh, show up at the celebration, which is going to be March 27th. It'll be either in this room or upstairs, but there will be a luncheon for, for everybody to participate in. And so what we've done is, is to remind people to, to remind, yeah, remind people to submit their pledges is we're putting in a ball for each pledge unit. Now it says a hundred at the top because there are a hundred pledge units here at Emerson. That means there could be a hundred families Right. 
Our closing hymn is number 207 in the gray hymnal, Amazing Grace. so happy that you allowed us to come today and you know share our hearts with you a little bit and uh, you know to hear from two very powerful women uh, who have been through the experience and have walked it out and, and have risen to the challenge of making the world a better place and I've been reflecting on the hymn uh, that I think was a very poignant way to start the service and there's so much work to do I think that may be the truest statement that we've heard this year, and perhaps in any year. So whether you're from Greensboro, North Carolina, like our son is, or you're from Michoacan, like Crystal's family, or from Caracas, like my own beloved wife, or from Argentina, like my own father, there's so much work to do. And you know, in this moment, as we're watching things uh, play out in, in Ukraine, and really watching the world come to us, there's, there's so many ways to engage on this issue. Um, opening our homes, opening our dinner table, or working on policy that can make us a more welcoming nation for all of those who come in the future and seek refuge from us to make the process easier and really to just love each other. So I'm gonna leave it there. I understand that we're gonna come back maybe for some opportunity to discuss things, but. There's so much work to do. Thank you. We hope you have been nourished in heart and mind by our worship today. Please plan to join us next week for the Senior Youth Service. As our chalice is extinguished this morning, please join me in the final words. They're posted in the chat for those of you online and in the order of service. We extinguish this chalice, but not the light of truth, the warmth of community, or the fire of commitment. These we carry in our hearts and out into the world until we are together again. Please join us for refreshments and fellowship in our fellowship room on the first floor near the back doors. Those of you online, stay tuned in and you'll be able to go to virtual breakout rooms for fellowship time. 
At 11.15, our second hour activities for adults, children, and youth begin. Please see the listings in the order of service. Our service is now concluded, but our connection has only begun. Go now in peace and take peace wherever you go.